So I want to welcome everyone to our first um, installment, and I think we're going to have several of uh, Pan Africa dialogues. I'm Gloria Kondrup. I am the executive director of the Hoffman's Milken Center for Typography in uh, Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, California. Um, I want to welcome Saki Mafandikwa here. We met uh, Saki two years ago at Art Center, and um, I thought at that time we had just finished our exhibition on uh, multi-script typefaces. So um, it was just fortuitous that Saki was in Los Angeles and he was started talking about his background. Saki is an educator, a graphic designer who started the um, uh, Zimbabwe Graphic Design um, uh, Institute of Visual Arts, right? Um, I think it's a very noble <laughs> endeavor. I know what it's like starting any organization. Um, so when we started to think about what would add to the richness of A type I all over, and we talked about all over, we really mean all over. And Carolina London, who's here, is the president of A type I, and I'm also a board member. And uh, I said to Carolina, I said, we really should do a, a, a series, a dialogue on um, start talking about um, reaching further across the globe, because especially in a digital environment, how important it is. Um, for us to see how far our reach can go. So I'm very happy to have Saki here. I'm very happy to have hit our speakers. Saki will introduce them. And um, I cannot tell you, Saki, how honored I am that you agreed to do this. So I'm going to turn it over to you. I'm gonna turn off my microphone. Um, if there's any questions, please put it in the chat room at the end of all this. It's gonna be rather long. I think we, in addition to Saki, we have four, uh, three additional speakers. I see Osman is here already. Um, I will pop back in for the Q and A to help organize that. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Saki, and, uh, and uh, you take it from here. And um, I look forward to learning myself more from you. Thank you very much, everyone. Sure. Thank you, uh, Gloria, for that uh, introduction. Um, it's an absolute pleasure and joy to present here today. This is the first time Africa is at A Type I. We hope to wow you with the work of three young African designers. All these designers come from uh, an organization called PADI, which is an acronym for Pan-African Design Institute. What used to happen in Africa is that um, there were all these, all these countries that there are design associations, and we felt that uh, it was important that we uh, go the Pan-African route and come under one umbrella uh, uh, group that represents a continent. It doesn't mean that uh, we are closing down the country um, associations. It just means that the, you know, the saying that there's strength in numbers. We felt that uh, Paddy was a great umbrella for, for Africa. And as you can see here today, it is now easy to pull our resources together because we're under this one um, umbrella group. Um, the school that uh, Gloria was talking about that I, uh, uh, I want to say discovered, <laughs> that I started in, uh, in Zimbabwe, Ziva, um, which stands for Zimbabwe Institute of Digital Arts. Um, the, I think I put in the in the chat room there. I put the uh, our URL. It's digital.org, and um, I also wrote the book uh, African Alphabets, uh, and it's out of print. You you still can get it online, but quite expensive. Uh, it should be coming back, hopefully next year, and where you can keep tabs on uh, progress on that front is. Uh, on sakimafundiko.com, which I must warn you is a is a new brand new uh, website, and so it's a work in progress. So please bear with me as I um, work on that. So, but going back to our three amazing uh, young designers, 
The first one is Osmond Chuma, who's from Zimbabwe, but uh, runs his own studio in South Africa. Then Simon Charway is from Ghana, and he's a, a, a master Adinkra researcher, and also he works uh, with uh, the Adinkra symbols, which you shall see today. And then last but not least, making his debut showing at an international design conference is the self-taught designer and typographer, Tapiwa Nashe Garikai from Zimbabwe. Our only female type designer from Nigeria was personally affected by the civil unrest in her country and had to bow out of presenting today. We wish her and her country well. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the work of these three young designers. Over to you, Osman. Hello. Um, it's an honor. Um, it's a great honor to be, um, firstly, to be to be invited here by, by Professor Sakima Fundika. Um, I think um, his contribution to my to my career has been quite has been quite a big. Um, um, I remember last time I said that, um, like when I was talking about, um, like he is actually the spark that literally like ignited my passion for for design. Um, so my name is Osman Chuma, um, um, and thank you for um, like having me here at um, um, Etapai 2020. I hope I pronounced it right. <laughs> so yeah, I'm Osman Chuma. I'm from Zim, and currently I'm in South Africa right now, and um, and. I'm um, I'm a designer. I'm a graphic designer. I'm also the co-founder of Mamko Bozi Design Factory, uh, which is which is um, an is a design studio designed and dedicated to literally um, um, celebrating African design. So whatever project that we we tackle, we always look at it with an African lens, um, um, and we always play around it and saying that like we are actually like a design playground because we are trying to literally break away from the norm of how design is um like without looking to the worst of inspiration so we like we're always trying to look um literally around us um because because in africa there's so much um, um inspiration so my presentation um today is called africa a crandall of design and and literally what it is is literally a love, like a love story between typography, identity, and, and African design. And growing up in Zimbabwe, um, I did art, um, and literally, like everything that was just around me was was a lot about crafting. So, so then that followed me into design, and and even when I went to a design school um, at the University of Johannesburg, then everything now changed because now we're being taught like the Western styles and um, um, like the bar house and then, and then all that. Um, and then only at the end was I able to like, to shake that out because um, th that's when I, uh, that's when I'm, that's when I watched um, um, a Professor Sagma Puntiqua's uh, uh, TED talk um, where he said like African designers like needed to look inwards. And that literally resonated with me because there was so much inspiration like around this and um, and most of us were were struggling with that. And like only when I started to now start to look inward did I, I started to find my own voice. So, so then what I'm going to show you today is literally the journey of my work like throughout the years. Is I was finding and then crafting, um, like like this person Osman Schumer. Um, so, so yeah, it's kind of a beautiful journey. Like some like some cracks like around the road there. Um, but yeah, it's kind of like a beautiful one, and um, and the work that I'm going to show you, like hopefully, like you'll be able to like it. So like the first one, literally, literally, like straight after um, after Varsity, um, I was working at an at a design agency called um, like Open Collaboration, and um, like one of the first briefs was this um, a radio station called um, Ikukwezi, and what Ikukwezi means, it's 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 a star. 
right? And um, and they wanted to rebrand because they had not rebranded in you know in close to like twenty years. And um, and what they are, they are literally the only Ndebele station radio station in South Africa, and that is quite big because because the Ndebele people, most brands reference them, like from the BMWs to the Nikes. Like everyone looks at them because it's how they use color, like in their murals, um, as you can see with um, with a photograph um, on the left. And um, even though the brief was more to make it more modern, more, more simple, um, we literally had to be like, no, let's let's literally go back to the basics and literally create something that you guys, when you look at it, you are, you are, you're literally able to see the Ndebele mural, and which is what everybody knows in Ndebele culture as being like the bright, um, um, like Ndebele mural. So, so then that's what we did. We literally referenced uh, like Ndebele murals to create this new identity. And and even with everything else, it was literally just a simple application of how can we take the wall from a wall to literally now as business cards um, in letterhead or like uh, and like everything else. Literally just giving giving people their culture. And and I remember the first things when we launched this thing, people were like, oh my god, I can see my culture. Like that is how people were responding to this, and that felt good. And then it was almost like a okay, cool. I'm getting to really understand that the more like the more that I tap into into things around us or like into Africa, because I'm creating for Africans. So why should I look at the worst to create something for Africa? I need to look into Africa to create things for Africans because when I create something for them, that is that is that is inspired by Africa. They're able to relate to it because they've been seeing it around them. Um like this is one of the projects that we did last year um, at Mamkopozi, like the company that um, that I co-founded with my partner, um, and and literally the brief was literally to to create a family crest, and family crests are quite. I think for me, family crests are quite like a European idea, um, and and the brief um, um, when the client gave us the references, it was also quite. Are quite European, like the um, the two lions on the side, the two horses, like that felt quite foreign. So then, what I like, like, like how the team then decided to to tackle it was say, cool, you know what? Yes, you want a family crest, cool. Um, but however, how can we create a family crest that that is African that talks to you um, as a Sutu person? And then um, our Sutu people are from um, are from Lesotho. So, um, so then what we did was that we then, we then like researched um, his, his culture. Um, he's a Mkwena, and um, Mkwena has come from Lesotho, so meaning that they're Lesotho people. So then what we found out was that the, the hat, the, the traditional a straw hat um, on the left, um, that's a Lesotho, um, a traditional um, a hat. And then Bakwena means crocodile, right? And instead of writing the family of Bakwena, we then just had to write it in literally in Sutu, Lelapa, Labakwena, and literally bring those two entities together. The, the traditional, the traditional Lesotho hat, straw hat, and the crocodile, but nicely in a nice um, a balance. And and the logo or the crest was quite a success because um, even when the client posted it um, um, on social media, other Bakwenas, even though they're not related, they were so they were so happy and they were and they, and they were even wanting to use that for their like for their family. Um, um, but then um, unfortunately, the client um, refused. But but then knowing that other Bakwenas out there also wanted this uh, crest as they as like, like that was just something that I was like, okay, cool. We're literally on the right direction. We just need to keep on digging like the same part and then just keep on going. So this was also one of those projects again um, that started last year. Like we're still working on it. And Okamba, um, Okamba is is a clay pot. And um, and this brand Ukamba Beer Works is one of those amazing um, 
uh, beer companies like in South Africa, um, located in Cape Town, the literally merge culture in the new modern age. Um, so then they make beer using hops. However, how they think about every single thing is always based about how um, how Southern African people used to sit, like, sit around. So way back, um, people used to sit around a tree or like uh, after like a long day, like in the fields, and then they'll share umkombote. Umkombote is a traditional beer um, that is made, okay, okay, you know what, if I keep on going to show <laughs> yeah, but the traditional beer, um, uh, I think there's a bit of sogam and millet, if I'm correct, I forgot, but but yeah, it's a traditional beer, and that is, um, that takes some time to make, but like, it's a way of c- celebrating. And that beer um, is shared around Ukamba, which is this uh, uh, pot, which is um, on the left. And um, and what we did was like, okay, cool, we like we want to send you like you want to rebrand, but I think let's try and literally mage the the past and the present. Um, and um, and then what we did was quite simple. We literally took the clay pot, and 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 nicely tried to balance it with the new hops, just to bring those two ideas together. When one looks at it, you can still see the ukamba because ukamba is a clay pot, and then you can still see the hops. And then with that, what we then did, we then designed the, the packaging of it. But but then what we then created like a visual language whereby we then used symbols um, and icons from around um, um, like Southern Africa, like to create this nice pattern that will work both both on the packaging design and on tissues or like on either other collateral. So one of the one of the projects that I'm currently working on right now um, is it, is a project called um, Africa Love Letters, um, and and right now what I'm doing with this project is that I'm actually using Instagram um, as a um, as my notebook or like or like um, as um, as my research. Um, I started this project I think around uh, March this year, and um, and on Instagram I go by the title. Um, Wakwa Chuma. And, and what it is literally, it's, it's me writing love letters to Africa. Um, me showing my appreciation for Africa. And the way that I do this is I create, I create um, independence, um, a branding, logos for the branding. So for example, you will see that when a country is celebrating its independence, I will create something to, like, to honor that um, um, as my way of saying, um, Africa, you're amazing. So the first one was um, that I created was for Ghana, Ghana, Ghana 63. And the inspiration there, um, I was inspired by the Andingra um, symbols. And um, in this particular one, it is the Dwinim symbol, um, which represents humility and strength. Um, and for me, it was now creating this sixty-three, and and almost like, almost like, almost like recreating like a new meaning around it. Um, to say cool. So, so Ghana, Ghana is now sixty-three. What does that mean? Does that mean that we need to be like this, and we we need to become together to to be strong? So you will see that like, most of my work is quite, or like the work that we also do, like at Mamko Bozi, it needs to be conceptual. Like it needs to be conceptual, it needs to be um, relevant, it needs to speak to the people or else it's just flat. And, um, and this is one of those things whereby when one looks at it, when you then look at the meaning for the symbol, Andingra symbol, what does the meaning say? And what does 63 mean? And what does 63 in the context of the country mean? And one is able to come up with all those different meanings. And, and even when I create these things, or like when I post these things on, on Instagram, because I use it as almost as almost as a as a research. I will write like the brief meanings of the symbols, but I wouldn't go to the full meaning because I also want the view of the person viewing this and like, to come up with their own meaning, like almost like to say, um, you must analyze this thing using maybe like a semiotic analysis. Like, what would you come up with? Like those things, but everything you'd be like, oh my god. This is what it is. Oh, this is this is amazing. I think it is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, this one, this one was quite hard because coming from Zim, and then um, I think prior to this, I had done I think about two or three. So then everybody was, was really like, "Oh my God, like we, like we really want to see what you're gonna do for Zimbabwe." And for and for most people who have seen um, like some of the designs that are done for Zimbabwe or, or like anything that is a term Zimbabwe, there's always this use of the the Zimbabwe bird, um, and the Zimbabwe bird is quite like it's quite one of those birds that. Uh, represent the country, like uh, on the um, on the Zimbabwe flag, it's there. Um, but I wanted to take a, a different direction with this one. Um, and then one of the one of the inspirations was the Great Zimbabwe Ruins, right? And um, there was one aspect of it. And then I had to look for something else just to mix those two concepts together, like to create something else. And and what. And the second one was the Nyami Nyami. Nyami Nyami um, is, a, is a Zambezi river god, right? And, and the story goes that the Vatonga people of Zimbabwe and Zambia, um, when, when, the, like when, when hunger um, like would strike some time way back, the Nyami Nyami would literally offer its body to the people and people would cut it, like cut it up. And then um, they would go home and then cook it. And then, the, and then the snake, the river god would literally regenerate again. So I took those two concepts. Um, one is Great Zimbabwe, the ruins, um, like an amazing place that most people have, have debated about, um, about it. But it's a place that shows greatness and also this place. So by taking those two concepts together, almost like creating this new thing of saying, who are we, one? Two, are we now in ruins, but we are great? Should we look back to who we were back, and um, will that serve us like, for the future? Like playing around with those things, like just create a new meaning, and also forty years. What does that mean like, for Zimbabweans? Do we really Zimbabweans really celebrate forty years? Um, so it's that. But for me, it's like my gift to Zimbabwe. This is what I'm giving to you guys, and this is my own like um, interpretation. Eritrea, Eritrea 29, inspired by the patterns, um, Habish, um, a traditional addresses. And then using the patterns, using the patterns as a, as a way to design like a typeface and literally having fun because what this whole project is about is literally me just experimenting. Like there's no, there's no, like there's no, literally no, no formula. Um, it's, it's, it's me saying, cool, um, literally opening my mind to say, I don't know, like, I don't know much about Eritrea. Yes, I'm from Africa, but I don't know much about uh, like Eritrea, but opening my mind and reading and then studying and then trying to try to understand what goes on into Eritrea. What do they do? What do they eat? Right? Can I get, can I be inspired by something from there? You see, and then, and then, and then this came out. Um, a very complex um, typeface that I'm still, I'm still working on it, but it's those things that literally are like quite um, like interesting. Like with every single country, there's there's so much to um, like look forward to. Chad Sixter, inspired by them, would that be um, a tribal? A tribal um, scars. The Wadawi people believe in, but them um, um, making uh, making um, these markings on their face that actually makes them even more beautiful, right? And it is beautiful. And when you look at that, there's so much inspiration. And for me, that was literally the inspiration to create this, to say. Through this beauty, there's so much that I can create. Burkina Faso, using the sun, the sun spirit mask, which, people, um, which the people of, um, of Burkina Faso used to celebrate like a new harvest. Using that as an inspiration and say, cool, how can I create something to celebrate Burkina Faso? 
and everything just comes together. And even when, and even when you look at it, you're able to see the like the inspiration, like where it comes from. Liberia, the Dan people, the Dan people of Liberia, um, like they create these masks, quite beautiful masks. And, and in this case, just using the eyes and the nose as a structured uh, to create a typeface. It's like those things like, okay, cool, what can I create out of this mask? Like, is it something that I can play with? Is it something that I can experiment with? It's like those elements that just come together and, and it's quite beautiful. So, Inspiration is around us, like constantly. I live, I live like in Johannesburg. I live in the in the um, in the city center where it's noisy, <laughs> um, and people always say, "Like, why don't you leave?" And for me, it's like it's, it's very really hard for me to go to like, in, uh, like a very quiet place because for me, I can literally easily take a walk down the road, bump bump into someone who's selling vegetables or selling something like that, and that like, like inspires me. Oh, I can walk do down the road and then uh, I'm literally just um, in a shop that sells um, a traditional wear. And then I can spend maybe the next 10 minutes there. Oh, I can walk 20 minutes and I'm actually at uh, Komamai, right? And Komamai is a market, it's actually um, a traditional, um, what can I say it? It's a traditional Hiller's market, but also slash with some traditional regalia. So everything there is just, just African, and I can spend the whole day there, right? And and for me, I wouldn't want to leave. Like I wouldn't want to move away from that space because because that is where like my inspiration is. But yeah, when I look at this, I'm like, this is literally me experimenting, but there's something beautiful like in it. Gabon Sixter, using like like using the guardian um the guardian the guardian um figurines like that shape the outline is the basis of cool is a way that I can play around I can play around it, but to create something quite beautiful and removing all the other uh, other elements. And the people of Gabon believe that they believe in the power of the afterlife. So then what am I meaning? Like what am I saying by that? By by using the, this object to represent Ghana's 60 years. So it's like they're creating like they're creating a meaning and then asking you like a question. Yeah. And every time when I when I create this work, like it's always a thing of I have to, I have to. I have to have fun, one. I have to be educated. I have to, that, that, that is the whole point about this project. But also at the same time, I have to also give myself to it to say, cool, thank you for educating me. Here's what I created from your knowledge that you gave me. This one is quite special because it literally, um, I talked about certain things that, um, like Africa is going through right now. So the mask, so the mask on the left, um, that's the queen, um, the queen's pendant uh, mask, um, a stolen 123 years ago um, in the Benin city. Um, um, now the Benin city, which is now part of Nigeria, and and using that um, as an inspiration for the 60 years of Nigeria. Um, for example, now if you like, like um, if we were to go deep into about it, right? It's a, it's a thing of cool. Um, sometimes when I reference, I'll take little bits of ele elements of it. In this case, I took almost every single thing, except for the eyes and nose and mouth. Um, one thing I can say is that um, I took everything else, but except the face, the identity, right? Um, and then what am I saying now? Is another idea of um, when something has been stolen away from you, 
Like, are you now like a faceless person or what? Like, you, you don't have an identity. The, the, the stroke that makes the six, that is, that is, that is um, inspired by the, by the altar task. And usually altar tasks are usually two. They're usually um, um, on the sides. Um, okay, I don't know what's happening there. But they're usually two. Like they always go in two, like create a shrine. But in this case, it's one. And what am I saying there? Am I saying that now the shrine is incomplete? The altar is incomplete. So, and using something that hasn't been in Nigeria for the past 123 years to celebrate Nigeria. Using something that, is, that hasn't been in Nigeria for the past 123 years to celebrate 60 years of Nigeria. Celebrating 60 years of, of independence. So it's like creating all those meanings, nicely layers of meanings that when one looks at it, it's, 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 it's not just a, a plain 60. There's a story. It's storytelling. It's a protest. Um, one can say this is, this 60 years is literally saying, bring back the Benin mosques, bring back the, the, um, the Benin bronzes. One can say this 60 years evokes emotion of, like this, these things weren't created just for display. These were religious objects. So yeah. So you can see with the whole body of work that it's like there's that, there's that education, me going deep, um, digging that information, um, creating this work um, and it's conceptual, um, tries to represent the people and evokes some bit of emotion sometimes. So um, I didn't go through like all the work, um, but this is just like a, a some of the work. Um, if you follow me like on Instagram um, at Wakwa Chuma, like you'll be able to see like the whole project currently going. Like I'm not finished yet. So other countries, I still need to create other countries' um, uh, work, and, um, and and you can see that with all this work, when I started, there's not. There's no structure. I know I, I know I need to create something. Um, but if there's one thing that is literally the base of every single thing, it's that I need to read and understand and, and be educated by the country. Dig deep, try and find something that I can work with and be able to pull that and create something from it and say, cool, here's what I created. You gave me the like you gave me the the raw materials. Here's my offering. So yeah, um, it's coming along. It's beautifully coming along. And, um, and some of the stuff, it's, yeah, like, um, like I always look at everything and be like, like it's all like a, like it's a process. Um, there's some that I love to the core and then there's some that I'm like, yeah, yeah, cool. I could have done better. But I think for me, it is that, like to say, cool, it's fine. It's fine. It's okay. Like you didn't write the, the, the correct spelling for that, but it's fine. Leave it, leave it as it is, and this next time, like you're learning, like it's process. Just tell myself to keep on believing in the process. Yeah, yeah. There's so like there's so much um, inspiration like in Africa, and um, yeah, and um, and some of these things were done during COVID uh, time, like under lockdown, and um, and hopefully I'll be able to finish this by by next year may and maybe do like a like a physical um exhibition so thank you nyabonga and again i'm osman chuma on instagram waka chuma and then you can also check out our page um on instagram at mamko bozi and the website is uh www.mamkobozidesign.com thank you So I'm just gonna go live for a minute. We're waiting for Saki, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> cool. okay.
our next presenter. Uh, I hope Saki comes back. I don't know where he is. That's kind of interesting. <laughs> Welcome to technology, Osman. So, um, yeah. Yeah, um, so I, th I think we've lost Saki, and I know he was going to introduce. I don't know who was next. If Simon, if Simon was next, or if he's here. Yeah, yeah uh, I think Simon is next. Yeah. Yeah, Simon Osman is here, and I don't know where Saki is. <laughs> Maybe um, I can um, ask Simon if he's here. He can turn on his camera. And maybe I don't know if he's loaded his presentation. Um, well, you know what? Until Saki comes back, I think what I'll I can do is ask you some questions. I thought. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, here comes Simon. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Hi, Simon. Yeah. Hi. I know. Hi. I don't. Uh, nice. Nice to see you. I don't. I think. Uh, I think Carolina might have uh, loaded your presentation. Not quite sure. Yeah. I don't have access to it. Here it is. Great. Um, Asaki is probably something happened, <laughs> you know, welcome to the world of uh, internet connections. I was even having some problems. Um, yeah. I mean, can you tell me a little bit about yourself, because I think Saki was supposed to do the introduction, but I know um, just a small um, two lines, I'm going to turn it over to you. So when you start, I love, love your writing system, first of all. I are you here? Yes, I, I, I'm here. Great. Yeah, I'm okay. here. I'm here. Okay. Uh, Simon, we can put you, if you want to sit down here, Osman and I are going to go away, and you can do your presentation. And uh, just before you start your presentation, do a little bit. Oh. Okay. Okay, so. Okay, my name is Simon Chawi. I think by now, a lot of you might have uh, seen that um, design is a cultural response indeed. If you look at what Osmond has presented, we all can see now that design is a cultural response. A directory in solidarity, a directory in solidarity and support of the underrepresented creatives. Okay, so I'll begin. I'm also the found, I'm a founder of the Chawi Studio, a brand identity design studio. I'm a member of the Pan-African Design Institute, which is the Design Council of Africa. I have this opportunity to present to you working on with indigenous African design systems. So like I said, um, I will be taking you through three uh, parts of my presentation on getting ideas because most of the questions I had from social media and from a lot of my students have to relate with how I'm able to work with indigenous African design systems and African symbology in brand communication. So I'll also share the part two, share my process, and then some case studies, real case studies of five works I did for some clients. So I'll begin by asking, where do we do ideas come from? In fact, I'll say that we have seen is we all know creativity to be the central thing about design of design. Creativity is a culturally inclusive concept. Therefore, I always see design as a cultural response. Every culture has its own narrative. And as you can see the, by the slide here, you see that in uh, African narrative, we can talk about the Ikiaba door, which is a fertility door in African context. Like I said, every culture has its own narrative, and therefore design is a cultural response. In Professor Mofanjukwe's presentation, keynotes presentation at the World Interaction Design Day, he shares a very notable uh, statement that really resonates with my process. He said each, each country in Africa has its own design sensibility and ways of doing things. This is so true. And as I go through my slide, you'll be able to see that is very, very true. Now, a lot of questions have also been asked on 
How can creativity be supported and fostered across all university disciplines in Africa? This was one question that was asked on the Pan-African Design Institute platform by uh, Atul DeGraff Johnson. My response was that I found this reliable relationship between cultural studies and creativity. In other words, I see that pattern that for someone to be really, really creative, to create something original, though we all know it's that of all ideas that we see around there, they already exist, but they are inspired by something and it comes from cultural studies. So therefore, the call to action here will be that we have to encourage or initiate African and African, Africa and African diaspora cultural studies. What will this one do? It will expose our design students to Africa's heterogeneous culture, cultures, values, and creation. Consequently, this will begin to influence their works. Now, we could see from the connection between cultural studies and creativity. One typical example I can show you is, if you look back into history of African, indigenous African design system, something like the quilt, which was uh, historically, if you study the G. Ben quilts, a uh, story about them, you could see how it has influenced some Zulu, uh, cardigans, sweaters, and then uh, scarves. This is how these ideas can come about. Artsology also explores some patterns on the cleanest box, which share some element of African design or African design systems. These are maps on the top here, uh, Congo and uh, Baluba maps from Congo. On the other hand here also, we see some maps from South Africa. And you can see that it shares this prototypical element that influenced the design, the pattern on the cleanest box. Now, So that's, that ends the part one of my presentation. The part two will be on my creative strategy and design process as a brand identity designer. Most times as a brand identity designer, the questions that we usually ask is, how do you get the ideas? My strategy for that always comes from looking into the past, into our culture history, and then seeing with a modern eye how would this relate to the problem at hand? So in our Khan tradition or the Ghanaian tradition in symbology, we say Sankofa, which is an Adinkra symbol, which means looking into the past and picking what is relevant. So this is basically a statuette of uh, an Adinkra symbol we call the Sankofa Adinkra symbol. But I'll ask the question, do you know Africa has a design history? Because often we see that many people or originate, if you pick the next uh, history of design, graphic design, you could see less of uh, representation of other cultures like black indigenous people of color. In Professor Malfadiko's presentation, he titled his presentation as Design Born in Africa. In the African design system is predicated on the understanding that culture, every culture from which it is originated. In other words, there is no African design history without the study of African or Africa diaspora cultures. In the design you pick from Africa, you have to then, you can't just interpret it until you're able to know where the design is coming from. Because usually they are inspired by some aspect of culture. I personally, I grew up in unique locales where symbols were seen as integral part of the culture. Now, these are uh, African architectural systems. There are a lot we can learn from indigenous or African design systems. Let me dive in much more into even just mocks, mocks in Africa. If you look at the right top here, a stream top, you see that the magnificent mud bricks of West Africa. The second one is the great mocks of Djani in Mali. Whilst the third one is in my own country, the northern part of Ghana, the Larabanga Mosque, which is the oldest mosque in Ghana. But then the question I'll ask 
or questions that I often get is how then would any creative, be architect, uh, brand designer, system designer, how will this African design system influence their work? Now, so let me, there is this, uh, in 2010, most of my processes or way of understanding design started in much more intensively re intense research from 2013, where I had opportunity to also watch Professor Sakiman Fadukwe's uh, TED Talk on looking within. And then I also came across this uh, very statement by Soren Peterson, which shares some truth about African design and African symbology. He said the true beauty of African design lies in how it takes a complex concept like spiritualism and then condenses it into a generic symbol without losing the intent. That to me is the holy grail of design, as he said. And that's quite true. For example, I pick my, our own Larabanga mocks in the northern part of Ghana, and I was able to do, come out with other indigenous African design systems, as you can see on the screen. This could actually be a design a structure, architectural system for maybe a museum, or anything of a kind. Now, on um, creating of symbols, in 2013 and 2017, I've been having conducting some interviews, and one of them is an interview with a Japonimo, a man who is well versed in the Akan tradition in Ghana. He said, There is no end to the creation of symbols. Creating symbols is like just like organic chemistry. And there is no end to what we can do with cultural symbols. In that regard, I've worked with this man and I've been able to work on two, we are currently working on two books. One is the African logo design, which represents symbols, systems, and meanings. The second one also has to do with a new Adinkra symbols I'm creating for the Ashanti Hini. He is the king of Ashanti kingdom. The first one, like I said, it has to represent, if you look on the left here, you see these symbols, a preview of the symbols. Some of about thousand symbols inspired by indigenous you know, African design systems. Now, most people, or most, uh, even before this presentation, a lot of questions people wanted to, me to address would be how I'm able to actually get the ideas from indigenous African design systems. So let me dive in much to a specific symbol from my own country, Akan, which is the Adinkra symbols. This is the, one of the famous Adinkra symbols in Ghana, which is called the Jinyami Adinkra symbol. On the right here, extreme right here, is the Jinyami Adinkra symbol, which means unless God. And from here, it shows this symbol is revered by Ghanaians because of their hospitality. So someone asked, one asked me to create a symbol of um, a symbol that represents um, tourism. And then I created this thing. I, picked, I went into the famous symbol revered by Ghanaians, which is a genuine symbol. If you can look, you can look at the negative space. Sometimes the idea is to pick it from, not directly, but sometimes the meaning, sometimes I can pick it from the meaning, but in this case, I pick the idea from the negative space, which look like a human hand, shaking hands. Tourism and hospitality. Now, some of the ideas can even come around, come from utilitarian uh, object or domestic objects around us. If you look at most African uh, artifacts at, in, the, at the, in the home, you will see that we have a lot of them having similar shape or prototypical elements. One of which I've been able to deduce this symbol, a new Adinkra symbol I call a fie ni fie, which in Akan language, it means home is home, or as some will, will say it, home sweet home. I did this symbol during the COVID time to encourage people to stay home and save lives. Sometimes the idea could just be from a simple object like a spoon, as you have seen I've done over here. Sometimes it could just be from a wooden comb, but the whole idea is like Sir Peter said, deducing it into a, gener a very simple form and then using it to communicate something very meaningful. You could see here to this Anadikra symbol I've created 
called Berimba Ketechi, which, which means brave man, Berimba Ketechi. Now, the last part of my presentation, which I will, that's where I will, the, the whole focus of my presentation will be, will try to showcase um, five works I've done, actual works I've done for clients, my clients, brand design works I've done for some clients, working with indigenous African design systems in brand communication. Um, I've had opportunity to, uh, since I've started the African Design Matter directory to a lot of design educators have gotten in contact with me. And one of them is Mona Morton, who is a senior lecturer um, at advertising and brand communication at the University of the Art Philadelphia. And she also was interested in uh, connecting me with her student to teach how I work with these indigenous African design systems in brand communication. So I'll, share, I'll be sharing five different scenarios for you. So the first one will be on the logo I designed for the Pan-African Design Institute. Um, the Pan-African Design Institute is the African Design Council or the Design Council of Africa. Because different, strand, different cultures are coming together, or let's say different design institutions from various parts of Africa are coming together. It showcased a lot, and then the idea was influenced by the enchanting Adinkra symbol, which means life is has a, it's not it's not straightforward. It's, it has a twist and turns. That because different cultures, idea perspectives are coming, and therefore we ha it has to do with tolerance and the ability to focus on the goal of bringing designers of Africa together. Other elements that influence the design are all these similar Adinkra symbols, which some of them mean one cannot know all things. You see that it relates, meaning we need to bring all these people together so that what we share ideas. Another one too has to do with measuring rod. So I see Pan African Design Institute as the standard which represents all designers or all design bodies in Africa. This one also represents the one that beneath here also represents crossing path. Now, so that's how come the idea that I usually I get focuses from getting the prototypical element, how the lines are flowing to write the PAD, PAD, PADI, which is Pan African Design Institute. And this is how I've been able to apply it. So the logo in application, I've even used it to form some nice, beautiful patterns over here, as you can see. At the, the first uh, IDEC, International De uh, Design Educators Conference, uh, organized, held in Ghana, Winneba, um, you could see some of the pictures of various African representatives who attended that meeting. Now, the second one will be on a logo I did for Shalom Dental Clinic. It's a, it's a dental clinic based in Kumasi, Ghana. And the idea was to be able to create a logo which is beautiful because in Ghana or in African context, when you come to oral care, a lot of people really scare away from seeing the dentist. So that was one of the uh, for uh, sentiments uh, or the ideas that uh, the clients have shared with me that they really want a logo that will not scare people from visiting their clinic. So during the conversation, and so we've interviewed several uh, dentists, and then we've come up in our conversation, they wanted something beautiful. Then I said, is it like a poppy flower? And then we all laughed. But when I went back home, I realized that if you look at the symbol here, which is the tetrema, esini tetrema, which means in Ghana, in Ghanaian language, Akan language, it means, it literally means the teeth and the tongue. So it's the interdependency between the teeth, the teeth and the tongue. If you look at the petals of this poppy flower, you could see how they, they, they are well connected together. So, in a healthy, the teeth must be healthy, they must be held together. So these are the how I'm able to tie the meanings to each to these things. So then the idea comes out, how about I use the teeth, one of the tooth, 
and arrange it like a petal flower, the petals of this poppy flower over here. And that was how the idea came about. And this was one of the logos I did that really received a lot of feedback. And every now and then people um, keep receiving feedbacks. This is how the logo was used in application. You can see how nicely they have these embossed on their walls. And then as caucus and their brushes. Also, I did a logo for Maya Music, which is a, a Los Angeles a music a, a company based in Los Angeles, California, based reimagining music through AI, artificial intelligence. This AI is able to have situational awareness and unlimited musical renditions. So the whole idea was to create a simple logo that will be able to help them to uh, use the logo in their applications. And the ideas, as you see the mood board, I usually like creating mood boards. You could see that I have the Dwarfi Adinkra symbol over here. That Dwarfi Adinkra symbol simply mean, literally means the wooden comb. And the meaning is, has to do with a feminine quality, but more importantly, patience, prudence, love, and care. And that was the platform uh, Maya was trying to create for songwriters and producers. So you could see from the sketch how the idea came to be. This is the refinement stage. And this is how the logo was applied. Now, this is also a logo I did for the Jackson Institute of Innovation and Leadership. In African symbology, when we talk about authority or leadership, the first symbol or symbology that comes to mind has to do with the stool. So, and the client have expressed that the vision of the institution is to tie in with what the Ashantihini has one said, or Tunfo said to the second, who is the king of the Ashanti kingdom. He said, I will teach my people leadership. And looking at the keywords, teach and leadership, I was able to reference from several, I studied several design as tool patterns by the collection from Professor Abladi Grover, a Ghanaian professor in the arts. And then in Ghana, in uh, let's say in African symbology, the stool represents when, for example, when somebody, a person is, uh, is installed, a person is made a king, we say he's installed. When the person is ruling, we say he sits on the stool. When the person dies, we say the stool has fallen. Metaphorically, we say the stool has fallen. So you can see the, how the stool represents the authority of the king or the rulership of the king. So training creative leaders and innovative leaders, leaders means that I need, they want, and I've had the idea that I have to tie this to how the initials of the institution, which is J-I-I-L, to spell, to write the word, the initials of the institution. So you could see that this spelled J-I-L, which represents the institution, Jackson Institute of Innovation and Leadership. And this is how the symbol has been used to form patterns, interesting patterns. And this is how it has been used in some t-shirts for the students and some of their brushes and call cards. And even cloth, their cloth pattern. Now, I did this logo also for the, the Nelson photography, a Ghanaian photographer based in the US. And his name, actual name is Nelson. So I tried to like I said, Professor Sakiman Federico will always say, looking within. And sometimes, like I said, my design concept always has to do with the Sankofa. So I picked the Sankofa. These two symbols represent that in Christ symbol called Sankofa, meaning going back into the past. And then therefore, going back into the past, I need to study which cameras were being used before. That's the, so I picked the pre-digital camera. And I realized that the reset lever over here has Excuse me. Shared some prototypical elements with these uh, modern uh, Sankofa symbol over here. 
So I try to use it to write the D and the P. But if you are looking at it holistically, so you could see the photographer's name, the N initial, which is the N. And this is how the logo has been beautifully used on most of their things. And also we use it to form some patterns, as you can see over here. Thank you so much. And I would like to take the opportunity to actually talk. If you can, if you want to see more about the brief about this work, you can visit my website, simonchawi.com. Or you could actually visit my Instagram page or all my social media page with this handle, Simon at Simon Chawi. And also the Pan-African Design Institute, uh, or the, what I'll say, the African Design Matters Directory, which we are working behind the scene to go live. But for now, we have about more than 1,000 following on social media, Instagram especially, to see more some of the works progress we've made in over there. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And I thank Professor Sakima Fandugu and Etai for the opportunity to present my work. And I look forward for future presentations where I'll be able to share my work. Thanks so much. Great. Uh, thank you, Simon. Um, thank you. Yes. Um, moving right along, uh, right. The next presenter is um, Tapiwa Nashe. Tapiwa. Uh, he's loading. OK, there we go. That's the pure. Right. So the playlist. This is it. Okay, cool. So the next speaker is the pure Nashe, Sebastian Garikai from Zimbabwe, who's a, uh, a type designer. The pure, you can take it away. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Sagima Fundiba. Uh, a very good afternoon to you, or evening or morning to everyone. Uh, my name is Wanashe Sebastian Garkai, and I'm going to be talking about uh, African writing systems in the digital age. And I'm basically going to be tying in to what uh, Osmond and uh, Simon Chawe have uh, presented. So to begin with, um, okay, uh, uh, taking some time to load there. Okay, yes. So to begin with, uh, what is a writing system? I think uh, this is one of the major things that uh, really uh, confuses people, especially when it comes to African writing systems. Because when people, um, most Africans, most African designers that I interact with, when I talk to them about uh, writing systems, the first thing that comes to their, to their mind are uh, actually uh, Latinized uh, fonts that are stylized to look like African fonts. So just to break that 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 uh, that line of thinking, what is the writing system? Uh, and the first definition that we we see is one from uh, from 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 a dictionary from from a dictionary, which says that writing uh, it is a method of visually representing verbal communication. But there's one particular meaning that I'm interested in, which says that writing is information storage. Writing is information storage. And when you think along these lines. Uh, we get to start and uh, we get to understand African writing systems more. So you see that, for example, uh, some writing systems that we do have here in Africa, uh, in some circles, uh, are not regarded or are not identified as writing systems, like the Lusona sent drawings from uh, Angola or the Andika symbols from Ghana. Uh, as you can see, the, the, the Lusona sent drawings, uh, that one illustrates the story of creation. And the Sankofa symbol, Antigra symbol, uh, uh, it symbolizes taking from the past what is good and bringing it into the present in order to make positive progress. So when you look at these uh, 
when you look at these symbols, you see that there is actually quite a lot of meaning and it is a form of information storage. So it is um, actually a form of writing. This is in, uh, these are some of the forms of writing that we see here in Africa. So moving on from that, uh, we also see that uh, writing is not only a technology, uh, writing systems are not only a technology for, for, trans for transcribing a spoken language into, into, uh, into written. It is also a cultural symbol of a people and their identity. It is also a cultural symbol of a people and their identity. Uh, it shows um, the power of, of, of a culture, something that uh, a certain society can relate to. Uh, so this function is just more than uh, it's more than it's more than it's more than just writing uh, the spoken word. So just to share with you some examples of. Uh, the states of uh, African writing systems in the digital world uh, for now. Uh, there's one particular project that I'm interested in, which was uh, done by Shamra Patel, which is the Kigelia font, which uh, covers a number of uh, African writing systems, uh, in particular, Giz, Vai, Chifene, Osmania, Nko, Adlam. Um, and just to see, uh, some of the so, so some of the uh, writing systems there. Eh? There we've got we've got Vai, which was created around uh, 1983 for the Mandi language uh, in in Liberia. So you see now, if you look at it, it's quite unique. It's not. Uh, it shows that it didn't have. Uh, it doesn't have actually. Uh, influence from the Latin or from the Arabic uh, alphabet. It's, it's pure, it's something that's really unique, it's something that's really unique. And uh, moving in from, from that one, we have got, um, yes, we've got the Ad Adlam script, which was created by the Berry brothers uh, around 1989 to transcribe the Fulani language, which is one of the largest uh, spoken languages uh, in West Africa. And uh, this one has been actually quite a huge project and uh, it has got an endorsement from Microsoft and it's now pretty much present uh, online. And then we've got the core script, which was invented by Solomon Kante in 1949. And it was created to write the Mandarin languages again of uh, West Africa, another huge group of, uh, of, of language with a lot of speakers. And then uh, another project that's worth mentioning is the Google Noto project, uh, which was uh, which basically aims to 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 create fonts for uh, all the writing systems that are covered in the uh, in the Unicode consortium at the moment, and they've done a really great job at uh, creating fonts for all the African writing systems that are there. And the, uh, this one is Bamun. The Bamun script, which was created by King Joy of Cameroon around 1896, uh, for the Bamun or Shumon uh, languages, and uh, this one uh, it faced uh, usage faced at one point, but then right now it's not being revived and it's actually being taught in Cameroon, and which brings us to the next uh, to the next uh, project that's going on uh, at the moment, which is happening at the Njinga Boot Collection at the archives of the Palais. De Hoa Bamun in Cameroon. Uh, there they are digitizing all the manuscripts that were damaged uh, when King Joya was exiled uh, from Cameroon. So uh, these guys are actually uh, digitizing all these uh, manuscripts so that uh, type designers like myself can actually have uh, a reference of, uh, of where to start uh, if they want to create fonts for, 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 for this uh, writing system. And then another interesting uh, uh, project that that I came across uh, on, on the internet was uh, this uh, Giz font by Yakuno Malak uh, Ayaleo, uh, who is an uh, Ethiopian architect uh, and part-time type designer, who has been creating these uh, Giz fonts, uh, which is an Ethiopian writing system used to write uh, Semitic languages in uh, like Giz, Charinya, Amharic, Tigre, Kuragina, and Harari. And uh, if you look at it, it actually moves away uh, from from the traditional from the traditional G's uh, 
writing system uh, is actually quite interesting. As you can see, there is quite modern with the inlines, and there you've got uh, something that looks handwritten. Uh, it's yeah, it's something that's quite refreshing and new. And it's a sign that uh, typography is 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 quite uh, advancing here in Africa. And as you can see, more examples there. There you've got uh, something that looks quite geometric, and there another one which is pretty much decorative. And it's something that's really unique, something that uh, you don't see, get to see every day. And that is really a good sign. That is really a good sign of progress. And another example is all well, like uh, when one show more of his work, there you can see uh, uh, a script like a uh, version of the of the G script, which is cursive, uh, cursive like, which is cursive like. So if you want to see more of his work, you can uh, visit his Instagram at G's font, and he also has a website gsfonts.com uh, and it's got a wide variety of uh, all these uh, Ethiopic uh, fonts that are that have so many styles that have so many styles like literally anything you can find anything there you can find anything and then Another interesting project that's happening is the Missing Scripts project by ANRT, the Atelier National de Recherche Typographique uh, in France, whereby they are uh, digitizing all the missing scripts, all the missing scripts uh, that are not in the Unicode Consortium or anything that hasn't been, that hasn't been digitized yet. And as you can see, they, they've, uh, they've managed to cover most of the non-African uh, writing systems and they've created a glyph for 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 for, for each uh, for each writing system, and the students there at the ANRT have also been working on uh, on some fonts for African writing systems, which is quite quite uh, unique. Uh, something that's that's actually happening. As you can see, there are more some more fonts there, and this this not only covers ancient uh, the non ancient African writing systems, but then even the the, the modern the contemporary. Writing systems as well are also covered by this project. Uh, as you can see, the, the Mwanguego, which is pretty much recent uh, and quite new. And then, and then again, uh, another one. Uh, there, you see more examples of the script uh, of, of some writing systems that, that have been covered. Uh, as you can see, some old Bamun. Uh, which is really, really ancient. One of the first uh, iterations of the Bamun script. Then moving on, uh, you realize that we also have problems uh, with the current writing systems that have been uh, that have been digitized or the ones that have been uh, uh, put into the Unicode Consortium. We still have problems, especially when displaying uh, the African writing systems on the web. There is an example of Adlam on the web. There, you can see there is nothing. Uh, there's just those uh, not, def not defined boxes, is it? And uh, it shows that uh, support is quite, is quite poor at the moment, uh, despite the, 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 the writing systems having been uh, encoded into the Unicode Consortium. And uh, another example that as well that I would like to share with you is uh, uh, the core writing system as well, which has been, which was encoded quite a while ago. And even though fonts exist again. Uh, Rendering these writing systems is a problem as well. And as you can see, the, the, the diacritics are not well positioned. The, the letters do not attach at the bottom. And yeah, so it's really problematic. It's really problematic at the moment. So much work needs to be done, although they've been uh, encoded into the Unicode Consortium. And then a project that I'm going to share with you today is something that I've been working on uh, also. I'm working on digitizing the Nguanguego script, which was created in Malawi by Mr. Nolens Nguanguego in 1979 to write uh, uh, Chichewa, which is uh, the main uh, local language in Malawi, and all the other indigenous scripts spoken in Malawi. So as you can see, uh, there is an example of the Nguanguego script on, on the left. Okay. So in my process of, uh, of, of digitizing, script. These are some of the steps that I, I go through. So the first step is obviously looking at the analog uh, sources and then researching on the users on on on, on the the font uh, on 
on the users, on, on the creator himself, on on the, uh, on the characters, how, how they work. And then the next step would be the Unicode, going through the Unicode and then working on a font, shaping it, and then churning out something that's digital. But then with the Nguango script, we don't have, uh, it's not yet encoded into the Unicode consortium. So I did a bit, uh, something that's uh, a bit different with this. Uh, I skipped that process. I skipped that process. And I'm going to show you how I managed to, uh, or how I'm managing to, to achieve that uh, without uh, the Unicode consortium. Okay, so the first step is uh, analyzing uh, those uh, analog sources. So I, I, the first, uh, one of these sources is the charts from, from the Nguangwego script that were created by Mr. Nolan Nguangwego. And as you can see, there's the basic syllabic repertoire of the characters uh, of the letters, and it shows how how they change as you add uh, the vowels, as you add the vowels. And uh, also, again, uh, another source, uh, which is still on, on, on the charts. And this shows the different types of uh, word compositions you can get from the different characters. So the Missisi words are only words that are created from uh, from the base uh, from the base characters, and then the Missisi words are characters that you create when you have the vowels added. And then the Mitua words are the characters that you get when you have the diacritics added. So they it helps uh, it helps me or it helps anyone who would want to design to get a basic understanding of how uh, the letters uh, interrelate with each other as they sit next to next. Uh, and then you can also get a better understanding of how to position the diacritics uh, and uh, the vowel marks. So they are uh, another source, the book as well, which is the only book on the Nguangwego script. And this also helps you to understand the uh, the heights of the, of the characters, the, the spacing and the weight and how you should uh, and generally lay out the text. Like you need to understand it more. It writes from from uh, left to right uh, and it's only horizontal. You don't write vertically and stuff like that. So it's, it's a really uh, useful guide. So, uh, after having that, done that, uh, they moved to, to create uh, the characters. Uh, and here we've got the 32 Missisi or the syllables. And these are the base characters of the Nguangwego script. So these are the base characters of the Nguangwego script and below are the Latin equivalents. So those will be the basis of, uh, of everything that we are, we are going to be doing. And they basically uh, determine anything that's going, anything else that they are going to be designing. And then on top of that, we've got the vowel marks uh, for the A, E, O, and U, and then the material, which are the uh, diacritics. And you've got the diacritics actually are actually positioned uh, just before the base consonant, which they'll be modifying. And then uh, you've got other diacritics that are below marks and others that are above marks. So that's that's how they look. That's how they look. So when it comes to text shaping, when it comes to text shaping, uh, it's pretty much basic. So you've got your, uh, your your base character, your base consonant, and then you've got your your vowel mark. And then when you uh, when you add them together, you get your your full syllable there. So ba and the vowel mark o, you get your bo. And then uh, with the diacritics, your ba and your diacritic mula, you get bla. And then ba and uh, mitrio miwaya, you get your boa. So basically, that's uh, the basic uh, basic test shaping that happens, and that's how the consonants and the diacritics and the vowel marks uh, affect the the base consonants, so that you get uh, different syllables and different sounds for 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 the language that you'll be using. And then yeah, so for the keyboard deck, uh, how I managed to 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 bypass the the the, the, the Unicode uh, stage. So to create something that was usable, uh, I had to use the Latin encoding uh, to create uh, this font for, for the Nguangwego script. I had to create a Latin encoding. So just to take you through uh, quickly how, how the Nguangwego script works. So if you put a base consonant bar, and then if you add the vowel mark, you get the B. Uh, you get add the vowel mark for E, you get the B. You add the vowel mark for O, you get O. 
and then get the add the vowel mark for u, you get u, and it goes on like that. So for our hack, what we actually to do is that uh, using the Latin encoding, using the Latin encoding, I actually created uh, uh, required uh, ligatures. I actually wrote uh, open type features for that, whereby when you enter b, you just get the consonant ba, and then when you enter b, e, you get the uh, syllable b. When you enter b i, you get the syllable b. When you enter the uh, uh, keyboard characters B O, you, you get the syllable Bo. When you enter B U, you get the syllable U. And it's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. And it's quite usable as it is. It's quite usable as it is. The only downside is that uh, not everyone can get to use this because uh, not everyone will have this very same font. For you to use it, you need to have this font only. And uh, this is just mainly for for inside usage for the creation of uh, promotional material for the Mwanguego script and uh, creation of uh, books and other stuff like that. And then there we can see the analog versus digital. The first analog, the, the sources that we had, uh, the handwritten sources. And there you can see below uh, the font that has been completed now and how it will look, uh, how it looks like. And this actually makes it easier uh, to create uh, books that are actually quite readable and uh, the, the dissemination of the script uh, or the educational material for the script will be much easier with this, it will be much easier. Okay, yeah, so with that, I uh, know basic syllabic, uh, basic syllabic repertoire of the script now is a font. Now is a font. There you can see the repertoire of the uh, formats added to the base consonants, and now it looks pretty. Now it looks like a proper uh, working font. Now it looks like a proper working font. And uh, with that, uh, I would like to say thank you, thank you to Professor Sagima Fundiwa for this uh, opportunity. Thank you for to uh, ITYPL for also uh, giving me this opportunity to present this and uh, Tatenda Siawonga. And if you'd like to get in touch with me, uh, you can get in touch with me at Seb Gary Design. Uh, that's my handle. And uh, we can talk more about that. We can talk more about, it. especially the pre-Unicode uh, stuff. Thank you very much. And thank you, Gloria. <laughs> great, great, great. I'm here, Gloria. <laughs> oh, great. So can we have... Yeah. Um, 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 if everyone, uh, can we have everyone back, uh, including Simon and uh, Osman too? Osman. Since yeah, so uh, and stay here, Tapishwani. Just don't go away. Um, maybe Saki, you might want to put up that wonderful image you had earlier. So oh, yeah, it's up to one. you. Um, okay, let, let me look for it. Sure. Take take. Um, so I have a. If anyone has any have a, if you have any questions, you can put it in the Q and A. Um, my role now is to besides ask questions. I'm sure Saki has some questions, but if anyone has any questions, I would definitely put it into the uh, Q and A. Um, if you haven't looked in the chat room yet, or I'll also check the chat room. And for those of us who would, thank you, very nice. For those of us. Where is that, Saki? I'm just curious what that is an image of. This is called Honda Valley. It's in the on the border with our between the border between Zimbabwe and Mozambique. The mm. what we call the Eastern Highlands. It's 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 really beautiful over the mountains, as you can mm. see. So um so um I guess um, one of the references we uh, people have been asking is about your book african alphabets and i think we put okay. uh, where people can get it yeah. um uh, i think it's going to be reprinted next yes. year so i'm working on a uh, on a new edition which is not just like a, a reprint of the book it's, it has a lot of new material mm -hmm. uh, uh, writing systems that have been invented uh, since the book came out, right, and just more research that has been done uh, in the field. So it's really, it's almost like a brand new book. Right. Uh, I, I think maybe you can speak to that or uh, Tapushwani. Uh, 
it can uh, speak to, I think, the explosion of the interest in African writing systems. Have you noticed that? I think it's one of the interesting questions when you mention, you know, the Noto font and how how do you feel they've they've been have they achieved both Saki and uh, anyone can answer. Do you think that they've actually achieved what would be considered, you know, culturally correct renditions of these languages? I mean, it's very interesting when you try to homogenize. Do you think they've been successful? You can be honest. Well, I, 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 I'll, I'll answer that and then Tapio and Asha can, can uh, respond as well. But I really think that uh, as far as African writing systems, I think like uh, it's like an ongoing project. I don't think that uh, we've really reached the tipping point where we can say, oh, we have really achieved like the kind of like, um, you know, in my book, I say that I really hope that these writing systems can be digitized and then can be, can be available readily for anyone who is interested in them on their keyboards, on their, you know, on their mm -hmm. computer. I don't think we've reached that point yet. There's still a lot of work to be done. There is some some work that's being done that's really commendable. I think we 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 mentioned the work of uh, Jamra uh, Patel. Yes. Uh, right. Yeah. You know. Uh, so it, it, yeah. it's it's a to step in the right direction, but I think more work still needs to be done. And I just want to say this. I want to add this little addendum, and that is that I really wish that uh, some of that work will come from the African continent itself. Yeah. And I know that what I know what the challenges are with that, you know, that requires funding and, you know, and that's a big challenge in uh, when you talk about uh, uh, making these uh, writing systems available as fonts. Tapiwa, what do you say? Okay, uh, with you. Uh, in the sense that uh, more work still has to be done. Because I think, as for now, the awareness is there. The awareness is there. But then I realized that the awareness is only there on the international platform. But then here in Africa, mm -hmm. there is, like most people are not even aware of these uh, uh, writing systems. They are not aware at all. Like, uh, And it's really sad because uh, you find out about this stuff from other people who are not on the African continent. And yet, uh, the owners of this, uh, the, 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 the custodians of these uh, right of these African writing systems, are not even aware of what's. In there. I think as long as they are not yet aware, uh, we still have a lot of work to do. We still have a lot of work to do. But I think uh, yeah. we, we we are in the right direction. I think I think this brings up the point, and I think Saki, you brought it up um, to me earlier too. And I think Osman, you can talk about this. It's interesting how, uh, you know, instead of bringing design from out of Africa into Africa, Osman, it should go the other way, right? I mean, I think what's in, what what struck me is how important your environment is to your design. Would you ever? Could you ever? Be the same designer if you left Africa? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's one of those things we're buying. Like I've also, I also have a background in advertising. So, so um, I know that other side of the, of the world whereby we try and create all this fancy world, right? Whereby we are selling these ideas to people and people don't get it. Like, 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 it would be telling a story from a person from Spain, like to someone, like, um, like, and then we're like, guys, like, it doesn't work. Like, we need to be able to tell stories that people know, you see. And, and for me, for me, that, that is important. And, and yeah, I think, I think that's a, that's a very good question. If I had to go somewhere else, I think I'll really struggle. I think I'll have like an identity crisis. Um, um, cause, cause, yeah, like, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, no, can, I, I chime I... In there? can I chime in there, uh, Gloria? Yes, absolutely. Uh, with, especially with uh, Osmond's work. 
I really think that uh, like because he works with the with the Latin font, you know, with the mm -hmm. Roman alphabet, right? That I think that he can adapt to any kind of like a cultural background, really. I think Osmond, I think you will be okay if you go somewhere <laughs> else. <laughs> I, 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 I think yeah. You just employ the same methods that you're using now for Africa, for that particular, you know, whatever country or cultural background that you find yourself. I think you will be okay. I think you are actually an international designer. You can do well anywhere. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I think everyone, I think Simon has already shown that he takes his work. I know if Simon wants to join us live, I mean, he has to hit his live button. Um, but I think both all, all three of you, four of you have shown that you might, you maintain your, your cultural, you know, uh, history is imbued in your design and design thinking um, is, is international. I think that's the one thing we have to always agree upon. How we look for design and what our inspirations are particular to you narrative and the story that you're you're telling. But I agree with Saki Osmond. I think the way you think and when you mentioned earlier, and I think this goes for everyone. It's so interesting what your early education was in design. Like what were you shown in design? Was it strange to you to say, why am I being taught? these principles without being taught other principles? I mean, what was your early education like in design and typography? Was it traditional, Saki, would you say? Or did you for me, have tri Oh, man, for me, my, my design education was totally Western, completely yeah. and absolutely. You know, I mean, I started uh, doodling uh, Roman alphabet uh, letter forms when I was little. In fact, before I went to school, I was just like so enamored by letter forms, you know? And I also didn't realize that there was such a thing as printing. So I thought everything was done by hand. So mm -hmm. my, my whole sort of like uh, thing with, uh, with, with the alphabet was really like, I wanted to do it so well. Mm -hmm. So that was really my my sort of like uh, how I got interested in, in, in design is through letter forms, the, the, the Roman alphabet. So it's I very say, yeah, yeah. 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 It's very interesting. And maybe Osmond and Tepiswan, uh, I'll never get your name right. Tapio Anashe. Tapio Anashe. I'll get it. Just like you, you're going to mispronounce my name, I'm yeah. sure. No one can pronounce my last name, so I, I deserve it. <laughs> I, I, no one pronounces my name correctly. And yeah. I think maybe what I what I what I'm finding very interesting, Simon, and this is where you and uh, you know all of the guests can help us in the world of in the world of design and typography. We're at a point where I think in order for our, you might say, design and typographic ecosystem to survive, right? We need to make sure we, we don't continue what might be viewed as a monoculture. You know, I think we've reached a point where everything, like you said, is a certain sameness. What by digging back into your cultures, you're infusing and, and, and adding variability to what we see visually. You know, I think, I think that perhaps has been your response, Osman, right? And all of you, you've responded to what you see is very expected and monoculture without your infusion of variability from your own stories. Do, is, is that one of the reasons you really reacted to what you see today, like you're not seeing your history, you're not seeing your culture and design. Oh, yes, man. true. Yes, yes. Like, um, and especially, especially me coming from from advertising, like in South Africa, right? Because because I will dabble in design and um, and advertising. Um, that was before, like I left is left and then decided to go full time into my composing. It was like like there was an African design. Like, like, like 
like when the um, Eco Crazy logo came out, um, before then, like patterns weren't even a thing. Like um, there was still some bit of um, 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 like patterns that were still coming out, but at that time, like it was quite, it was quite special, and um, it literally was a way of saying, you know what, this is my own rebellion to literally look into Africa because whatever work we are creating in the space of advertising and whatever, it was just adopting um, um, everything quite quite European. Um, like the idea is like, like the TV ads that we're doing um, was very like westernized. Like very few agencies were quite uh, telling that story. And then I was like, I want to go back to design again. And uh, that's when we have a part and then created um, a composite to say, you know what, we, we're going to create um, African inspired um, work. And and yeah, and, and now more people are like, you know what, we see it, we see it, we see it. And yeah, yeah. And I guess it was a nice um, like rebellion. I just want to add that, uh, like for me as a yeah, design educator who has gone sort of like around the world running workshops and teaching, that's really my method. Yeah. I encourage students from different cultures to look at their cultures for for uh, uh, problem solving, whatever they, the work that they're working with. And it, it, it really works. It's pretty amazing what the, the, uh, the students produce. And I've been fortunate also that I have taught um, classes that are multicultural, multiracial, you know, from different backgrounds. And at the end of my workshops, they all create work that's very, very different because they learn now to dig deep into their cultures. Because it's not just Africa. Here, I know this forum, we're talking about Africa, but this, the, the, this is true for people from, you know, Asian background, people from South America, people from Aboriginal uh, backgrounds from different parts of the world. Yeah. Simon, you wanted to Simon. say something. Yes, yes. Yeah, I really appreciate Pong Profs. Uh, as he said, he well, his method has been about teaching across the globe. And I think it was his 2000 TED talk that actually re resonated with something I've been thinking about a lot in design class. And then it has actually influenced a lot of my work, my work in college back as 2010, 2008. And I could say that if you look at what I'm doing currently uh, to answer your question, you see that I define design as a cultural response. Design is actually a cultural response. And if design is a cultural response, then we should, if we try to uh, represent design history from one perspective, then we are stifling the other cultures or the well-run view about seeing what we mean by design. And this is where I'll say that the next evolution, if you can see now from the works we've presented, especially if you look at Osman and then some works of Garakai, you could see that the next evolution of designers are actually creative people who are learning from different cultures and creating from multiple perspectives. Those are the kind of works you begin to see um, I had the opportunity, if you look at um, Sir David Ajayi, the Grit British Ghanaian architect, his uh, Instagram page, you could see that he started sharing some cultural uh, symbolism or Af African design systems, artifacts on his page. It's a series he started sharing. And these things could in inspire a whole lot of ideas. In fact, as um, Professor Sakima Fodugo is, a lot of, I could see from the comments that a lot of people really are interested to learn more about these things we've shared and they are asking are there books out there and that's quite unfortunate we can't see much book out there but i think all of us presented here professor Sakin from Mofatiko himself is working on his second edition of his book the african alphabet myself i'm working on a whole lot of books that will be a statement to actually address representing culture even my the african design matters initiative which represents works of blacks 
not just Africans, but Blacks, Indigenous people of color, try to make a call for an all-inclusive, um, diverse and all-inclusive what design art design curriculum. If you look at the Maggie's uh, design history book, you could not you could see that it doesn't represent all cultures, and that's what we are trying to change. I know Garikai, we've been in contact and conversation for a while now with Osmond himself, and I know all of us are working on projects, and these projects are not just things we want to keep in our on our PC, but we want to convert them into books so that it becomes a statement out there on decolonizing design education. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I think that's important to have resources. Ta uh, Saki and I were talking about that too. How do we have resources that are accessible? And I think that's where, of course, the uh, digitally, the a digital environment would help, but there's still nothing like a book. I do have a question from someone um, about, um, what do you think about the creation of writing systems for languages that have none? I mean, this is a very interesting point. We hear, we assume that all languages have writing systems, but they don't. And I assume, and maybe we assume that this should be in the domain of typography and type design. Who develops I, the writing systems? I want to respond to that. Mm -hmm. uh, that question was from Cesar Puertas. It's just unfortunate, really unfortunate that uh, Lotana, our fourth presenter, wasn't able to present today. Yeah. She is uh, from the Igbo uh, people of Nigeria, and uh, she, she went to school in the USA, and I think she started business. She has never been inside a design classroom. She's not a typographer. She's not into type design, but she designed a writing system for her people, for the for the Igbo language. And she was going to present that today. But like I said at the top of the uh, uh, of this uh, session, that uh, the civil unrest in in Nigeria going on right now, which affected her personally. She wasn't able to present today. It would have been really, really great to have somebody who's not from uh, our background, the, the, the four of us here, somebody totally, completely different. And that is what has happened in Africa and in other parts of the world, that writing systems haven't been designed by typographers or designers. That's the response. I I think it's um, it's an interesting question, and again, it's a it's it's a very complicated question. I think uh, Saki, you also, um, in terms of teaching, I think it's become it's very important that educators understand the importance of culture and diversity. And that uh, uh, question came from Aaron. Um, are any of you interested besides Saki? in teaching. You know, I think that's one yeah. way of really, go ahead. Tapishwani. Tapiwanashi. Yeah. Tapiwanashi. Tapi we'll call him Tapiwanashi. Okay, I now. actually wanted to answer. I'm so yes. embarrassed. <laughs> no problem. Okay, I actually have a question on uh, writing systems, on writing systems. Uh, uh, like, I think it's really important to create writing systems, especially for African languages. Uh, like what was done by a native language, and uh, a really great solution because uh, the writing systems that were being used in 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 West Africa at that time uh, couldn't represent the Fulani language properly. So it was actually difficult for people to to write their own language, and the creation of uh, of the Adlam script uh, was actually is actually revolutionary, and it's actually a solution to a huge problem. And uh, these guys started working on the script when they were 12 and 14 years, I think, 12 and 14 year old, and something that's really amazing, something that's really amazing. And you also look at uh, uh, Nolan's Gongolens when Malawi. 
say they want to, to replace it because you know the Latin alphabet is yeah, it's a sign of colonization. So he created that to to replace uh, the Latin alphabet and also to solve again the issue with the linguistics with uh, how Latin alphabet is not able to 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 transcribe uh, our local languages very well. But then the there is a huge barrier to the creation of scripts, especially in Africa, because there is lack of support. There is lack of support from the government, from from the people themselves. So, although it is a good thing to create a new writing system, getting support is another that we might need to overcome. Right. And the and I guess uh, the point here you're trying to make is that the those Berry brothers, right? They are not designers, they are not typographers, yeah. but they exactly. invented the very sophisticated uh, 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 writing system. Exactly. So Simon, are you going to teach? Yeah. I think and the question about both? teaching yes. <laughs> needs yes. to be answered. <laughs> yes, in fact. Uh, I, I, I really love teaching. I believe the best, one of the best ways, aside giving out books, the best way is to teach. So if you look at my Instagram feed, uh, quite if you go down slightly, you see that I've shared a lot of my processes. I like sharing what I'm doing. And I think that's something that we, we all have to find ourselves in classrooms. And it shouldn't be just in our own very immediate environment or schools, but it has to do, we, I, I, like I, I'm advocating with design educators that we should have exchange programs. I remember when I was in a second year, level two and around 2009, eight there about, I had opportunity to have an exchange program with some foreign student from Royal College of Art in Northeastern Illinois. And their, their perspective on design, everything has also influenced me a lot. And I believe if, for example, imagine I'm in uh, Osmond, when I was in college, I had opportunity to go to uh, South Africa or Zimbabwe to meet uh, Garikai to meet them their works. I think it will to inform our work. So on teaching is very, very, very important. I think uh, it's part of, and to work on that, we have to rework on how we aim to do. That is the pedagogy. Because the current uh, design curriculum will not create that environment for us to uh, actually open up our uh, other coaches because it's focused on just one central Eurocentric kind of approach. So we have to also look at the way we aim to teach uh, our design students. Yeah, true, true. Um, well, um, I don't know about going full time teaching. Uh, but then um, I do, um, I do get called um, here and there at the University of Johannesburg uh, to come and give like um, our guest lectures or like um, like um, like literally help out students like from like from first year students to uh, honor students. So so um, I do I do like help. Uh, and then currently right now, uh, because of COVID, um, I think I was assigned one student. I forgot I forgot if it was a master student or like an honor student. That I'm literally um, like um, helping him with this project, so so yeah, um, I do help out, but I don't know about going full time. It, um, I think I could. Um, I just haven't thought much about it. <laughs> yeah. 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 Actually, yeah, what you're doing is great, Osmond. You don't have to uh, teach full time. There's what's called the adjunct system, where you you are a full time professional but you teach you. one or two classes a week. That's kind of how a lot of us started out uh, yeah. in, 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 in design education as an adjunct. Okay. I think also, yeah. also for everyone, um, mentoring is good, speaking at conferences are good, doing workshops. I know we're coming to the end of our talk, so I don't want to um, go over. It's been almost two hours by the way, very fascinating, we're almost at two hours. But I want to say that we can continue, I believe A Type I has a hangout room where everyone has access to it. And I know it's a much more personal um, room where people can see you and you can see them 
if you wish to join. It's not mandatory. But I think this has been quite refreshing and quite interesting. And it's just touching the surface. We're two hours and it's not enough. It's not enough. We can do, Saki, I think a whole program around. around oh, this. I, I, and, uh, I, 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 absolutely. And yeah. I think that as but, a as a beginning, this 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 has been great. Yeah, and and I really hope everyone else realizes that too. That this was, it's so unique, and I'm so happy that we were able to help facilitate. The HMCT was able to help facilitate bringing everyone here, and uh, hopefully we'll 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 do some more. I I know we look forward to it. I wanted to thank uh, Tapa Wanashi. <laughs> and and uh, Osmond and si I'm getting it. Yay. Thank you. And Osmond and Simon and Saki. It only took me two hours. Uh, so I humbly apologize um, uh, to thank everyone again for your time and your effort that you put into presenting and, and bringing to, I think, a type I a very interesting um, perspective on type and design and an interest and to open up an interesting uh, discussion that I that I think is extremely valuable to the type and design community. So I want to thank everyone for attending and uh, go to the hangout. I think that's the best thing we can do. And uh, maybe one of my tech people can help me uh, end this because I'm not quite sure how we're supposed to end the recording. Um, but um, um, I thank you again, and I will see.